brand new. Welcome everyone to Use It Tomorrow AAC Data Ideas. I'm your facilitator, Jessica Conrad. I'm a speech language pathologist and specialist with the Patents Project. If you're having any audio issues on your webinar, try signing out and signing back in again. And I see that um, a bunch of you already started to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about where you are from. People are coming in. Please pop in the chat where you're from. Um, I think Katie is winning right now, coming from California. The other thing I wanted to note, you could have been doing anything today, but you just decided to come up to a session about AAC and data, a very specific, narrow sort of um, webinar. So tell us a little bit about why you wanted to. I'm going to go ahead and end this poll. Thank you for filling that out. Let me know we have a variety of people here today. So while we are launching this, since this is a small group, I am very um, chat box oriented. It's right there on the screen for me. I'm going to be asking you guys a lot of questions about your experiences. I know we have some people who are AAC, um, very AAC astute and very um, well versed in a lot of AC. And then we have some people who are brand new or didn't get a whole lot of it in their training and are um, slowly um, getting some progress in there. So I put a question, and so the question reads, if an assessment shows us where we are and informs us where we could be going, where are you? Are you, are you feeling completely lost? Are you sometimes not sure where you're going, not always sure where you are? Um, you know where you're going, but your team isn't always following you. Or are you the person that you have the map, the snacks, the plant, like you know where you're going. Um, so everyone feels a little differently, or maybe you, depending on the student or the building that you're in that day, might be a little different. So gives us an idea. And it's already, I will um, say for the people who are watching this recording in the future, we have a variety. And that is very typical, I think. So you could have been anywhere, but you wanted to be here. And I think we're going to talk about some good things. As always, we have our accessibility promise. So we have those captions via Google Slides. And those of you who are reading, watching the recording, there will be true closed captions at the bottom of the screen if you click on the closed caption button. Real font, high contrast, all images have alt text, digital materials for you to use, as well as resources you will be getting, and multiple real life examples. We're using case studies, and I think those really help us relate and understand what we're talking about today, and multiple opportunities for consultation and support. And as always, if there's anything I can do to make this accessible to you, please let me know. And I'm working for Pathless, promoting achievement through technology for all students, supporting our Indiana public pre K 12 students and schools and creating that sustaining and equitable learning environment for every student. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I'm actually going to pull some of our um, favorite services into this presentation. But I did want to point out training and virtual office hours have started up again this year, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern. If there is a specialist meeting that's at a time that does not work for you, always reach out to that specialist and we'll set up a time that works for you one-on-one. -on -one. Today we're going to be looking at some case studies. I um, have a, a um, part of my job, probably more than 50% of my job is doing AEC consultation. And I kind of pulled the four most common situations where perhaps the team needed more assessment data and how we went about that and what tools we suggest for those situations. And what I want to ask from you, and you can unmute yourself, you can pop it in the chat box, but the three common questions or themes along this is I'm going to show you off the tool and how to use it. If you have anything that you're like, oh, I use this tool in my practice, but this is how I use it, or I really find it useful for this situation, I love hearing about that. So please share those kinds of things. We're a small group and we're all really interested in this. So please share your experience. I'm going to be talking about what that assessment gives you. And I'm going to be discussing what is it missing? Like certainly not all assessment tools do all things, what other information do you need to gather? How do you gather them? And then at the end, there's an evaluation. And for those of you who are um, frantically taking notes, you will get the slides in the entirety, as well as many of the digital resources I've referenced. I'm just basically saying exactly what I said. You will get all those resources when you fill out an evaluation. It can be a bad evaluation, but you'll still get the resources. Disclosures, I am a patent specialist and a member of ASHA and ASHA SIG 12, which is AAC. And I'm also the president of the Indiana Division of Early Childhood, and we're always uplifting those excellent DEC recommended practices. 
and today's um, presentation involves all of these recommended practices around collaborating with families, cleaning, transitioning, environment, assessment, etc. And as always, that visual representation of the Every Student Succeeds Act. All I'm going to say about this is patents provides um, is partnering with schools to provide access and universal design for learning. All of these things that we do in the middle assessment through our curriculum and instruction and collaboration, good assessment needs access and access needs good assessment. So starting off with our case studies, I want to reference that all of the case studies here are sort of um, compilations of several case studies kind of squished together to kind of provide um, some privacy and Thank you very much to the um, 12 teams who have agreed through that consultation process. Let us kind of pull some information from those. The consultation process is for Indiana pre-K 12 folks. It is at no cost. And when you fill out this consultation form, you get paired with one or more patent specialists to sit down and really in depth go through that student and figure out what it is your goal is. So some teams come with a goal of we want to figure out a device or other teams have a goal of we've already kind of figured out a system, an ecosystem of communication tools, but now that we're transitioning to middle school or looking at transition to adulthood, it's not quite meeting our needs, so how can we tweak it? In other situations, teams are like, I don't know, we just, the kid just moved in, I've never worked with a kid with this kind of profile, what, how do I even start? So whatever your need is, whatever your identified goal is, pair you with the right specialist and help you through that. And also, um, if it involves borrowing tools, you have that lending library at your full support and unlimited training and follow. So related to all that, we have our first case study, and this is Liam. Liam is three years old when I met him. Um, he has CP and multiple other medical conditions, many other um, medical diagnoses, and has very, very frequent seizures. He is a student that um, if he's awake for 20 minutes at a time, that's a really good day. So the team report um, on that consultation, he is free communicative and as a student who is free AAC, needs lots of practice with cause and effect before we can consider an AAC system. I'm going to pause there. What kind of, any thoughts right off the bat? Pre AAC, free communicative, the student who is pre AAC. Anything right off the bat? Can I say something? Yes. And this is not, I'm not a professional. I'm a parent of an AAC mm -hmm. user. No one is ever pre AAC. Like who determined that? Um, AAC applies to babies. Mm -hmm. That's my initial thought after reading this. Sorry. Thank you for saying that. There's no person is pre AAC. We have professionals who are pre AAC understanding, but no person is pre AAC. You are, well, so this kind of also leads us to communication matrix at every move count. Kim kind of took the words out of my mouth. Are they ready for AAC? And I think um, Katie, you know, immediately, absolutely excellent, excellent point. So this series, um, Use It Tomorrow AAC, very much is focused on that, and I mean it, being able to use it tomorrow. So there are a ton of great assessments and I'm so glad Kim brought up every move counts. It is a fantastic assessment and in this situation, we absolutely coached that team into doing it. But every move counts is not something that I feel comfortable. If I'd never seen it before, using it tomorrow. So the assessments that I'm pulling for this particular situation are ones that I feel like with very minimal training and very minimal guidance, I can teach you how to use this um, tomorrow. So every move counts is absolutely a fantastic tool. So are they ready for AAC? You might already know this. If our very first assessment, how do you assess if someone's ready for AAC? And I love this handy decision-making flowchart. This is evidence-based and I've passed it out whenever I have somebody saying like, oh, I don't know if they're ready yet. I'm like, okay, we have this evidence-based assessment. Are they breathing? And if they are, then yes, they're a candidate. Maybe not every AAC system in the world, but you're ready for AAC. And I love this quote. I, um, I'm going to read it in its entirety because I absolutely love it when I say like we're going back to the research. This is from 1993. I'm not going to tell you what grade in elementary school I was in, but 
we have discovered increasingly that communication has only one prerequisite. It has nothing to do with mental age, chronological age, prerequisite skills, mathematical formulae, or any other models that have been developed to decide who is an AAC candidate and who is not. Breathing is the only prerequisite that is relevant to communication. Breathing equals life, life equals communication. It is that simple. If anyone knows James Earl Jones, I would love for him to read that paragraph because I feel like if Mufasa says it, if the voice of Mufasa said it, it would just blend that gravitas for what we're trying to say here. And that's really important as we go through this assessment process. When I have people say like, oh, they're not communicating yet, or oh, they, they're pre-communicative. Really what they're saying is we don't have the tools or skills yet to observe the communication they were already giving us. So, just like Kim had hinted, we're going to look at some tools that do give teens the ability to look and see, okay, if you have two neurons to rub together, you are communicating and you are learning. That is a biological imperative. What we're trying to do is give you tools to figure out what are they doing and where could we go next? How could we support and go to the next level? The tools that I'm also pulling, like I said, we're talking about use it tomorrow tools, but I wanted to give you an entire list of all the tools that we compiled as part of the Indiana Inclusive Communication Matters work group. Um, all of our Indiana pre-K-12 folks who are invited to join, um, this is a, primarily right now it's a Facebook group, and then we have um, virtual and in-person meetings for a select group, and then virtual and in-person meetings for the state at large. I want to pull up, you guys are going to get a link to this. It gets updated on occasion. Um, I'm always interested if you see a tool that is not on here, but almost all of these, you know, we have a section which ones are free, which ones are scored, which ones are more of a criterion reference kind of checklist, progress monitoring tools, all around AAC that may be really appropriate for your students. So I pulled out the ones that really you don't need a whole lot of training and you can use it tomorrow. They're either free or nearly free. The communication matrix is the first one that I want to look at. And that was the one um, most of you, probably 70% of you said you were familiar with it. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this one, but um, I do want to point out some of the really great features, especially for students like Liam. So the communication matrix this is adapted very um, loosely from the materials that were provided. We know that for students under the age of um, typically developing 24 months, those skills happen so quickly. You know that the average two-year-old, by the time they were born to two years old, gained so many skills so quickly, you blink and suddenly they've gained another skill. But what this does is it breaks down those skills um, from those ages and allows us to see what kind of progress our students with the most complex communication needs have. And what I love about this, um, as of today, it is still free. However, they have lost their, um, you know, they've had it for years, their um, funding from the U.S. Department of Education. It is still a fantastic tool, but unfortunately, those funds do dry up eventually. So it will be fee-based into 2021 for people who use more than five assessments a year. So for the average team, that might be plenty, like that's um, exactly the amount that you need. But if you have a very large caseload or you are working with this communication assessment as a progress monitoring tool, there is a small fee and it is pretty reasonable. It is in multiple languages, which I love because this communication matrix will very much, you need lots of eyes on this. And if you're not doing this with a parent, I think you're really missing out on some really fantastic data. What is this? Actually, let's go into the communication matrix. When you are starting out, if you've ever done one for the very first time and one online, I always recommend download the matrix questions. It will make so much more sense when you start to fill this out online. When I complete this with um, families and teams, I really recommend you all getting together. Either Zoom works just fine to um, complete something like this. So I have my student here. I'm going to start a new assessment. What they already have. I'm going to ask you some questions. I would say the average teacher or therapist would be able to go through this and um, answer the questions fairly well. Perhaps um, 
new team members or um, families, you might need to explain some of the terms. But this is what I really like about it. I find this very powerful. For example, um, the only way I know the student wants something is because they fuss or whine when they're happy. I'm going to say no is the passive stage. She doesn't come to me to let me know what she wants, but it's easy for me to figure out because she tries to do things for herself. I'm going to say yes, this absolutely describes my student. This is what I love about the online version. We're now talking about, can you tell that this individual doesn't want something such as a certain food or toy or game you're playing like tickling? Let's say this is a concept that's a little difficult to understand or like, oh, you know, maybe the way they show that is very unconventional. It has a short video. So watching that short video of um, another student might really jog your memory of like, oh, he does, fall. he does not like sitting at the table. We know he doesn't like sitting at the table. He falls out of it. And you may not correlate that necessarily with a protest, but that absolutely counts. What I also like about that is it also forces the team to look at what parts of the body, what, how are they telling you that? What parts of the body, because it may not be conventional, but it may be consistent. And gosh, if I have a consistent protest behavior, I can develop that in lots of really powerful ways. So not just looking at do they, but what parts of the body, what other skills are they using? So I say they okay, merging. And yeah, they fling their arms around, but legs, not so much. Going to exit out of here. You kind of get the idea. It's eventually going to keep asking you more and more questions. I would say your first one might take about 30 minutes or so. Um, if your student is um, very early on that scale, it may take even shorter. But again, my best recommendation is print out those um, entire V of the questions because it might help teams recognize that they um, want to give credit where credit is due for a student. I see a lot of teams submit communication matrices where um, they're saying they don't have any protest behavior, but I saw them in the back of the Zoom conference, you know, screaming and kicking and throwing things. Well, that's the protest behavior. They get credit for that. I want to bring up. So again, you can use this as an assessment for progress monitoring. What I also like about this, it's not super helpful on this one, is you also get a skills list of what they have mastered. And I apologize, there we go. So being able to see what have they mastered. And again, a lot of our reports and things are so based in deficit language. It's not very helpful to know the 72 things my child can't do. Tell me the 12 things they can. And let's build and see where they were six months ago. So if your communication tool only tells you all the things that a student can't do, I don't know that that's a great communication tool. What it also pops out is something that looks like this. It looks like a, um, oh, I've suddenly forgotten, a periodic table. And the way you read it is from top to bottom. So early pre-intentional behavior, intentional behavior, all the way down to language. And a level seven is considered about 24 months of age of typical child development. If you have a student who really is, um, you know, probably in this area of six and seven, it, this may not be the best tool. I think there are better tools for students who get further along. And it's also completely acceptable and kind of expected to see some really splinter skill type things. I think it's really interesting for students who, um, you know, requesting attention, really concrete, real, does things like that really well, but our students don't know how to protest. That's a great red flag for um, intervention to tell us, you know, we really need to work on them being able to say, no, I don't like it, and stop it, and all those really important things. I'm going to pause there. The communication matrix that was really brief, 
again, a really powerful tool, especially when we're trying to show teens all the in, in pre-intentional and intentional behavior that they have that's not quite conventional communication, being able to capture that and show where in progress we're supposed to be. I wanted to show one last thing, and I would love to hear from anyone else who uses this. What do you like about it? What do you think is missing? When do you grab it? The last thing I wanted to point out is the community. And I love this piece of it that um, many individuals from universities, people across the world are using this tool and having conversations about how do I use this? How do I set this up? So one of the digital resources I'm going to send you is um, two really nice articles from people associated with this talking about using the communication matrix when you're in a case conference situation and using it um, for things like um, justifying a device purchase, things of that nature. Are there any other comments or questions before we move on to Tasha? Ken says, I love the online when you're looking at the matrix. If you hover over a section, you can get a good explanation of what that skiller section is great for sharing with parents. It's also really nice to show progress. Look at all the colored squares that weren't there before. I agree. And having that visual representation of where we are and where we're going to grow. I think there's something, yeah, it's UDL, it's multiple means of showing a ton of information. I could give you a 12 page report or I could give you something that looks like this. Okay, so our next student is Tasha. Tasha is seven years old and she's trying a brand new AAC app. So Tasha's team reports that the trial is going really well. She's participating more in class and Tasha likes it and her family likes it. And so the question is, should the system be purchased? So I'm really curious where you are, what are you, how do you justify purchasing? How do you get the school system or um, your insurance? How do you justify it? Or are you lucky enough that you're in a district where, you know, it's kind of like Target. You just go in and point to things and you get it. I'm modeling excellent wait time, but not necessarily excellent silent wait time. Going to move on, but I would love to hear. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Kim. Um, if I can show students performing better with the tool than without, I have justification. Oh, that's excellent. Better performance might be class participation or ability to access staff, et cetera. Excellent. So that, you know, this is where we were without it. This is where we are with it. Excellent. So one of the things that um, teams are using is language activity monitoring. So this is, um, and we'll go through some of the specifics, but realized language, my Toby Dynavox, a lot of these apps and dedicated device systems have what's called LAM language activity monitoring. LAM is just a file that timestamps the usage on that device. So if one of the examples is at 12, um, 04, 32 seconds. Um, someone typed I, five seconds later, love, and then over a minute later, Spider-Man. So what would be one of the things that you might take away from that, knowing that I and love are really close together, and then Spider-Man was a minute later? You might say, oh, maybe that fluency piece isn't there. Um, knowing how that device is organized, it might be hard to get to those specific nouns. So. How can you take that data and kind of amp it up? In the last few years, companies have taken a lot of really cool things just based on this LAM idea. Susan had a great comment. I love using the shaded periodic table block showing 
parents and staff that map of skills, what's emerging, what we might focus on next. I agree. And so if you like that, you're gonna really love this. So language activity monitoring, um, some really great resources on LAM from Gail Van Tantenhoek and the AAC Institute. Some of the examples that are currently out, this isn't an exhaustive list, and that's why I kind of left that space there. Care these also devices, as well as um, their related apps, Lamplets for Life and um, Touchpad HD. Avas, Cough Drops, Snap Plus Score First, Katie said Grid 3. Absolutely. Thank you for adding it in there. If anyone else can think of any other devices that have that support built in. So this is an example of realized language. I'm going to try to zoom in here. It is not letting me zoom. So I'm going to try to be descriptive. I'm sorry if that's really tiny. This is a dashboard of realized language. So um, the device needs to be connected to Wi-Fi on occasion. It doesn't need to be connected all the time, but it's going to send those LAM files. And what gets organized is here you see a chart of when exactly the device was being used. You see a chart of um, the parts of speech and how many of those pieces, so how many nouns did they use, how many verbs did they use. Observations by day, and then a word cloud of what words were being used, and the bigger words are words that were used more often. This is a yearly paid service. I think it's only $10 a year now. And like I said, um, all of their dedicated devices, so the Nova Chat and the Accent, um, and Lamp Words for Life and Touch Chat HD, those two apps, also correlate with um, that realized language. Oh, let's go back to this part. This is an important question. For those of you who have used um, things like realized language or any of the other ones that are embedded, what do you like about it and what is missing or perhaps um, something that causes any issues? Any concerns with using it? If you had a chart of exactly what words were there and when it was being used, if you got a chart back from your personal child and this is when the device was being used, there isn't a way to distinguish users, says Kim. So if a mod so if I model on the child's device, it doesn't distinguish my modeling from their actual communication, correct? It might just be 90% adults, which for some students, that's kind of what you want to see, but you want to see what they did versus what other people did. Plus being able to use the data for planning. I don't like it that you don't know what's modeled versus when a student is using it independently. It doesn't necessarily show what the student is saying. So, and I didn't um, pull in an example of this. Toby Dynabox is the only one that I know of that you can differentiate. There's a little button in the corner that lets you show models versus what the student did. You just have to be smart enough and quick enough to be able to swap back and forth to turn the model button on versus the um, student button. It's a quick app for some students who, um, you know, love just copying exactly what you do. They might switch back and forth, but so far they're the only ones that I've seen that happen, which I think is really smart. Drop also uses LAM, but it's some other features as well. So um, this is an opt-in feature. You don't have to pay anything extra for it. It offers a heat activation map. So you can see perhaps the students gravitating toward one corner. Maybe there's some sort of field cut or field deficit we need to address. Um, also has information regarding, so it kind of brings up, a, it is a Google map that logs, you know, four sessions happened in this place um, between these two dates. You can see you know, perhaps a student is going out into the community and you're able to see, gosh, when they go to that McDonald's, he doesn't talk at all. And he loves talking at McDonald's when we're with him. So what is going on? Um, user staff, location reports, heat map. Is there anything else kind of interesting about that one? And all the same ones I showed you before. So the um, time of what happened, what was said, and in all of these LAM files that I've been able to peek at, if you wanted to see what was being said at Tuesday um, at 1030, and maybe that's speech time, being able to click on there and seeing exactly what was being said 
the feature in all of these graphs. One of the other things that's um, been brought up as far as land are some of the ethical and legal considerations of this. So who gets to look at the data? How is the data going to be used? Probably no one else in your school is being bugged 24 seven, knowing exactly what words are being said. So is there informed consent? How do we ensure that there's informed consent? Do the parents know how this data is being used? Can the student revoke their permission? And can it be revoked permanently or temporarily? Um, you know, when it comes to student data, students have a choice in saying, no, I don't want you to know when I'm talking all the time exactly what I say. So one of the suggestions that we have in almost all of these um, setups, there is usually like a button that tells you data tracking is on. So having that conversation with the student, when that's on, I can see every word that you are saying. And if you want me to turn it off, you need to use your turn off my data button. So they have that ability to revoke consent, but also give consent later on. In other systems, and I suddenly blanked on, it might be Nova Chat, you can actually set it up so they are big buttons that they can press and it turns the data on and off. So they get to do it themselves instead of just requesting that you turn it on. I'm gonna pause there, any other thoughts about LAM or LAM? I don't know if you're supposed to say LAM. All right, we got two more case studies. So this is a school team and Luis's family agree that they wanna try a symbol-based communication tool with them, but they're unsure how many symbols on a screen and how they should be organized. And at least one of the softwares they're looking at has over 67 different configurations. How do you choose which one? So in a world of overwhelming choices, how, how do you narrow it down? How do you know which one you're gonna go with? Because there are, there's so many choices now to imagine even 10 years ago, if you had said like, oh yeah, anybody can go to Walmart and pick up an iPad and a gift card and you're gonna have at least 150 different choices for less than a thousand dollars, people would have laughed at you. So how do you guys choose? Realize my this kept being turned off. If you tend to let me know how do you guys choose which one? Feature matching system, absolutely. So feature matching being one of the tools that's typically part of the set framework, student environment task and tool. And when you look at that student, the environments that they're in and the tasks that they need to do, what are the features that student needs to do? So if Luis is a student, he can point. He does really great at pointing and enjoys pointing. Um, doesn't have a lot of literacy skills. No vision concerns, no hearing concerns. And he's sort of in this category of, gosh, there, if we looked at the features and we've never looked before, what else can we do? One of the scariest things is when school districts adopt one particular app and that is the one that you get. If you go to such and such school district, you are going to be assigned this one. And some really scary things come out of it particularly students who kind of are stuck at one particular level and it's just assumed while well, they just struggle. Well, they struggle because they were matched with the wrong tool because they didn't consider any feature matching. Anything else you use? So one of the things that we recommend is a trial that is um, the gold standard in AAC, whether you're using the set um, framework, if you're using Georgia project, if you're using the WADI, if you're using whatever it is that you want to use to kind of help narrow down what that looks like, feature matching and then trialing it and taking data based on what is being trialed. 
Batten Blending Library partners with that AAC consultation process. So you're filling out a lot of information that is based off of the WADI, the Wisconsin Assistive Technology Initiative. And through that, we help um, teams sit down. And if you get me as your specialist, what this looks like is a lot like going to the eye doctor. And I show you an app when we go through the features, how the language is organized, how um, it's the research based off of Katya Hill from the AAC Institute, the primary, secondary, and tertiary considerations of AAC, the features that are there, what kinds of words are in there, how are they organized, how do you get to them, what are the peripheral features of it. And like going to the end, doctor, I show you one, and then I show you another. And then I say, which one do you feel more comfortable? What do you like about each one? Let's talk about the features. What do you think is most necessary based on the information that you already gave me? Because kids like um, Luis, who can point, who don't have any vision or hearing concerns, there's still 67 apps that could absolutely work for him. What we need to do now is actually get him with one and trial it in a lot of different settings and figure out how we're um, going to measure based on different situations, right? So that um, patents lending library can be very, very helpful for that. The AEC, Jamie, is kind of a um, oddball sort of opportunity. And in the um, evaluation at the beginning or the poll you guys took in the beginning, you said that not too many of you had seen this one. I want to show you, and I want to show you why I like it and why I don't like it. So let me move this to the side for a second. The AC Genie is available only on iOS, so it needs to be on an iPad only. I think it will work on an iPad mini. And it has multiple subtests within it about visual identification, um, discrimination, looking at um, vocabulary recognition of nouns, verbs, and functions, and then different types of categories like category inclusion and exclusion and being able to identify what a category is. It looks at unity icon patterns, so those um, PRC unity um, lamp words for life symbols picture description, as well as word prediction that you might use um, in alphabet uh, literacy-based AAC. So like I said, iOS only. It also supports switch use. So if you're wanting to evaluate that, um, many switch pat patterns, linear, two-step, and timing you can adjust, as well as pet verbal feedback. And it's in English and Spanish. So I'm gonna pull it up and show you what so here I have a student go into settings and again what I just said lots of um, options as far as um, dancing and feedback to go back cancel and we're gonna do our vocabulary gives you a quick instruction start find the word blowing so I'm gonna tap My student cannot log a tap until the audio instruction is done. I'm hearing a, a lag in the, the audio that you're getting and the audio that I'm getting. Every time I've done this, when it's not hooked up to a computer, it forces me to wait until that instruction is given. I'm curious if putting this, projecting this on a screen changes anything, which might be interesting for those of you who are doing um, distance um, teletherapy or distance remote learning. So I'm going to stop right there and go up to the top where it says data. And this is the report that it generates. So visual identification I did earlier um, gives me a percentage based on fields of two and three and four, you know, smaller and smaller buttons, more and more buttons, and kind of adjust the amount of space in between buttons as well. So um, small, medium, and large buttons. Vocabulary knowledge, it's just gonna give me a percentage correct. 
for picture description, you get a picture and then something that looks like a very basic core board and you can choose between symbol sticks and pick on um, vocabulary icons. And you have to create a sentence and these are the sentences that I created so you have some time to kind of analyze what that utterance looks like. Um, gives you a MLU automatically based on this and then I also did may not have worked. Oh, word prediction over here. Um, asks you to identify a word very similar to co-writer. If you were thinking maybe something like word prediction and co-writer might be useful for your AAP user, it will um, ask you to choose the correct spelling of four different words that look very similar. Gives you a word prediction score. Some of you did say you were familiar with this. But most of you did not. So I'm curious if anyone who has used it, do you like it? Who do you end up grabbing this for? I'll say teens who do like this. Um, if you have a student who will humor you, and for example, the visual identification, you can choose an object that they might like, a car or a cat or something like that, and you need to find that object everywhere. If you have a student who will humor you through that, through 40 different times of find the cat, find the cat, find the cat. This might be a really great tool to figure out, gosh, could we start with smaller buttons? Can we start with bigger buttons? Um, but I would still argue if the smallest button we're going to get is a field of 45, Lamp Words for Life is 82, Speak for Yourself is 144. I wonder if the bar is set a little low and we have students who can navigate buttons that tiny. They can give you some good information if you have a student who's willing to humor you. For other students who are not going to sit there and follow those um, directions, you're probably going to get really bad information. The other thing I wanted to point out, I'm sorry if that is so small you may not be able to see, but I could see a team looking at this and saying, wow, she got the best accuracy she got was a field of eight. And the next best accuracy she got were field of two and three. So maybe we need to give her very small buttons. But here's the thing, guys. Oops, turned off. The problem isn't that I needed small buttons. What I did when I was taking this was only touching the buttons in the bottom left-hand corner. That doesn't mean that I need small buttons. It may mean that I need the device adjusted. It may mean that I need some help um, you know, maybe I need my vision checked. Maybe I need to have this um, seating positioning changed. A lot of different things. This does not necessarily kick out information that you can just look at this unless you were there actually um, assessing and being active in the assessment. So I have seen assistive technology evaluations include AAC Genie information but didn't really dig into all the reasons why. And we've seen students, one in particular that was recommended, very similar situation, a go talk four. And luckily the team knew like, gosh, this doesn't really seem right. If he can get on mom's phone and navigate just fine. He's on speak for yourself, which is 144 buttons and semantic compaction. So he does just great. Could you imagine if we stuck him on that go talk four? Oh. Poor kid, that would have been terrible. And so it's interesting data, it's not a naturalistic evaluation, so you can't really see how highly motivated response might differ in just a structured academic response. After that really sums that up really, really well. Um, I think you're probably not going to get the best information. However, if you do have a student who can respond this way and humor you and actually be engaged and motivated with you, it might give you some good information to show Team Splash he can handle a bigger field, or you know, we saw him do these tasks and he's only on one side of the screen. That might inform your practice. The other nice thing is if your student is going to be um, using something the size of an iPad, having the assessment on an iPad can be very helpful compared to some of these other assessments, which are paper-based, such as um, the test of aided symbol performance is not electronic, it's paper-based. If your student's not going to be on a paper-based type system, it may not give you the information you need. Um, 
The last one of this that I also wanted to show you was the DAG2, and this one's also very, very popular um, with this group. So if anyone else has any favorite things you like about the DAG, it is used to assess and reassess current skills and a for AAC and develop a plan for enhancing communicative independence. Um, it also has seven pages of measurable goals along AAC competencies, which I love, especially for a team that's struggling to that where do we go next part, especially, um, and I'm speaking about myself and maybe a few of you will relate to this, I'm a speech language pathologist. So I think everything is about communication and language. I get so language focused, I forget about things like my student needs to learn how to turn the device on and off. My student needs to learn how to adjust the volume and let me know if repairs need to be made. Those are really, really important skills. Sometimes I forget about those. I get so focused on, I want you to be able to say hello and write a story and all that other really good, important stuff. But the dad kind of helps me recognize there are lots of things that go into communication AAC competencies. The DAG is embedded into Pathways to Core First, which I highly recommend for all teams. I don't care what device you are working on. It is a fantastic resource, has over 50 weeks of lesson plans, and it is free. You can download it for free on iOS or Windows. It also has printable and writable goal grids for both the DAG2 and if you work with anyone on um, stroke and brain injury um, profiles, has communication goals aligned to that, which is a little different than um, our school-based um, or average school-based kiddos. So I'm going to pull up The printable ver version is really nice. It's actually my, per my personal preferred way. Where are you, Pathways? Oh, I just thought. So in Pathways in the um, app, you create a student profile you have an option to build skills and it has those lesson plans embedded within it. But what it has down here is that goal spread. The videos that keep on popping up that I'm maxing out of are really nice videos if you're just getting started. For those of you who teach in preschool, this is gonna look a lot like Ice Route or those of you who remember ISTAR KR or some of those alternative measures, but this is gonna seem really familiar. So for example, I'm gonna go into here and I'm just going to read, um, and that looks probably very small to you. Communicates using pointing, eye gaze, pulling a partner towards something. I'm gonna say with medic, with medic, with medic. Um, but we're working on this one, using single messages during an activity to request more of a preferred activity or to produce a repeated line in the story song with a partner with reminders. So I say, hey, we're working on that. And then I'm going to click on this little box on the corner. It gives me three lesson plans all built around this particular skill that we're working off of. So this might be a great way to get started. I wouldn't say it's the end all to be all, but a great way to um, get started. And what I love about this, especially for families, so we have an objective. If your student is using Snapless Core first, this will all um, align really nicely. But again, you don't need to be using their products. It gives you five days of um, something for every day, as well as a letter to the family and talking about what you're working on. It also has books that are aligned with it, lots of really great skills aligned to that assessment. So it really fills in that, okay, where are we and where are we going? In the paper version, it also gives you tons of measurable goals and ways to measure those goals. Really great way to um, kind of a, a, a diving board that jump start to get started on, you know, you're using the same goal or perhaps you're using percentage accuracy on something where percentage accuracy doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It's built on a, cue, a hierarchy of cues 
instead of a percentage accuracy, which for a lot of our students using AAC doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Again, DAG is built through an emergent through independent hierarchy, so very ISPRAT like, very ISPR TR like. And then those four operational competencies. Again, the speech language pathologist, I sometimes get stuck in linguistic or maybe linguistic and social. But I keep forgetting about things like operational competency or strategic competency, which are really, really important and get my brain jogging and thinking about what are all the other skills we need to be to be successful in all these other environments that are going to be um, my student is going to be participating in. Looks like we've got nine minutes. Just enough time. So those are those other resources, those progress forms and novel activities. So this is the last one. This is the one that I would say I get the most of this particular question. When are we done with AAC? So Sonia, in this case, is a 14-year-old. She has childhood apraxia speech. She struggles with being understood by most people. However, most of her teachers and her family say they understand her just fine. It's not really an issue, but they also say she doesn't talk a whole lot. Um, and she's kind of struggling socially with her peers. Sonia used to have an AAC device when she was in elementary school, but once her speech started getting good enough, it was taken away and reassigned to another student. So here's the question, how do you, what else do we need to know? And how do you know when it's time to say goodbye to the AAC? For these students who are full-time AAC users, let's say, how do you know when it's time to be full-time speech? My question for you. How do you know? This is something that keeps me awake sometimes, like maybe never. That's a great answer, Angie. Maybe never. And am I the one who gets to decide that? Like, was I ordained with those powers? One of the biggest issues that we're now seeing in like, thank goodness, um, we have a generation of adults who are old enough to say, you know, don't take away my AAC device. And like Sammy says, for this student frame, it says we're all AAC users in different ways and have it as a backup if the student wants to use it. Absolutely. When you start thinking about Gosh, not all the time do I want to use my speech. Sometimes I want to text. Sometimes I want to pass a note. Sometimes I want to use sign. How many of you are using some AAC sign with your kids this week? All that is very, very valid. And we have a generation of adults who are now, you know, coming out of the woodwork saying, you know what? You don't get to take away my AAC. I know that I have mouth words, but I don't like using them. And I get to decide when I want to. And it's not for anyone else to take it away. So being very, very, very cautious about any removal of tools and really thinking about what it is. Absolutely. All of us are AAC users. When you frame it that way, and I'm going to take away a tool, why are you taking the tool away? Because a few adults said that the speech was just fine. But to that end, when you have adults who are not necessarily in agreement about how effective speech is, or maybe the student isn't in agreement, Student is saying, you know what, everyone understands me just fine. And this, you know, another adult is saying, like, no, I think that it's actually more of a problem than you think it is. The IASCC, the Index of Augmented Speech Comprehensibility in Children, is a free, non standardized assessment that um, is in that assessment list. And it's very, very simple. It has a bunch of single words like banana and computer and various things, and you could certainly make sentences. And what you do is you ask the student to say it. If you've ever given the Goldman Fristo, this is, it's a Goldman Fristo kind of thing, but you record it. And then you pick three people who don't know the student very well. You pick three people who do. And for someone like Sonia, you might say, pick three people, you pick the people. 
and we are going to ask them to figure out, can they understand what it was that you said? And then through that, you can create a quick analysis of how intelligible are you to unfamiliar listeners? How intelligible are you to, you know, your friends in class and the teachers that you um, know you well? And that might give a number to help inform where you need to go next. Certainly not meant to be a, you get the AAC device, you don't get the AAC device, but another piece of information that might help inform the student and their family and the people working with them and thinking about transition to adulthood, how intelligible are you? How is your speech actually doing what you want to do? I think someone mentioned it before, but things like the DAG2 can also be a great, that measure of where are we with the device? Where are we without the device? That DAG2, you can fill out twice saying, looking at, okay, can you do these things with your speech? Or can you not do these things with your speech? And when we try an AC device, what are some of the things you wanna be able to do? Maybe you can answer questions in class, but you're having a really hard time navigating conversations with peers. Could this help you? Or maybe it's not helping at all and we picked the wrong kind of device or wrong kind of tool. So um, especially a 14-year-old uh, want to engage that kind of assessment, um, engage them in assessment, engage them in that goal practice. What is it that you want to be able to do? And how can we make sure that we're measuring and really figuring out, is this actually helping at all? So three minutes to go, which is great for my very first time doing this particular presentation. I want to very quickly point out Friday is the um, deadline for our Indiana residents. If you want to apply for access to education, it's our two-day conference. There is a scholarship available. You just need to be an Indiana resident. So if you have any families or pre-service students or anybody like that, um, please fill out the scholarship application. You might just win a free seat to go to Access to Ed. Um, April 2021 is our Tech Expo. And finally, the evaluation. So if you would, I'm going to quickly grab this link and pop it into the chat box and I see that question. I am Jessica Conrad, like Jessica Rabbit. And this is Use It Tomorrow AAC Data Ideas for one hour. I'm sorry, I forgot to put that on the slide. Katie, would you be covering ways to collect data usage one by one? Eight? Thank you so much for bringing that up. So one of the resources, I can't believe I don't have that slide in there. You are going to get a pile of my paper data worksheets, but I please keep them, reuse them, you know, make them your own. But if you are looking at somebody like a one-on-one -on -one aide and trying to think of like, gosh, what is something that um, very flexible as far as what kinds of cues were being used? How often were you using it? Um, kind of talked about in language um, usage monitoring. It's really hard to figure out who is doing what. So I'm going to give you just a Google Doc that's going to prompt you to copy it. Make it your own. I do not have a lot of um, copyright or like concern about anyone reusing them. So thank you for mentioning that. Those are one of the